all right so <laughs> that was a glitch on the technical end uh now i hope that everybody can hear me let me just check the stream again all right so now we have got the audio all right uh, so once again welcome to the live stream uh, of gdg uh, cloud islamba gdg live and we are doing a collab on the uh, google extended uh, google io extended 2021 so it's going to be exciting sessions uh, both technical and non technical we've got uh, saba going for what makes a good presentation and we have got ramsha on giving us a lecture about the machine learning and what goes on so just a little bit intro about the uh, society what gdg is what gdg cloud islam bar is and what do we do so uh my name as i have already said is arshan anwar i am uh, the manager for gdg cloud islam bar currently i am the chief of product uh, in mega particle mega particle is a game studio that works in vr gaming we are working on the uh, oculus uh, and the rift these are one of the latest uh, headsets introduced by uh, facebook and this this is really amazing from my end that uh, it it's a really a dream job that you can do that uh, you're working in a game studio and working on games all right so uh, at the side of it i'm also a consulted cto for radical growth solution it works in agritech and previously i worked with jazz as a product manager as well so moving on what is gdg cloud uh, gdg cloud is a community consisting of developers volunteers that actually give you access to all the google technologies and its learning so that you as a community grow together basically the bottom line is we empower the developers just like uh, there's a very famous internet meme developers 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 right so we make sure that we empower the developers all the time in any way possible to make sure that they use all the technologies that are available to them all the tutorials that are available to make great products not only for themselves but for the larger community as well so uh what we really strive for uh, i've already uh, sort of defined that uh latest google technology Technologies and its awareness, connecting people under one umbrella, so we all like to work together. Uh, increase the number of developers with expertise in the Google technology, specifically the cloud technologies of Google. Um, I think uh, the latest report is that uh, they have around forty percent more profit, and they have cut down their losses by fifty percent. So that's like a ninety percent gain in revenue in the cloud department only. So uh, cloud is the next big thing. Anybody. who uh, you know cannot have access to a very powerful pc they can always have a very powerful cloud network pc so they can make amazing things and it's no longer the limitation uh, to you know have a very powerful cpu to work for you all right so uh, what we have been doing in the past two years uh, as you know corona hit but uh, before that and even after that we have been trying our best to make sure that everybody gets an access to all the technologies that we possibly can all the non tech uh, trainings as well so uh, we have been having devs we have got wtm uh, sessions we have got uh, digital uh, sessions as well so we have got code labs we got meetups tech sessions panel discussion and just like you said in the top uh, right corner io extended this is what we are doing to create in the live session all right so uh, before we go on to the uh, main uh, workshop i have a very small announcement gdg cloud islamabad is looking for social media managers so if you think you can manage the social media very well uh, just let us know uh you can inbox us on the group or you can email us on gd uh, gdg cloud isb at gmail.com i will just share the email in the comment section uh after this announcement as well all right so before uh, any further delay uh, let me invite in sabakul soon so let me see 
Sabah, can you unmute your mic? All right. So, hello, Sabah. Hi, how are you, Ashna? Really good. So, uh, first and foremost, uh, the only intro, the great intro that I always give is Sabah is one of my juniors from my alumni uh, from the NAST as well as the same campus. So, Sabah has been working as a community manager right now, and I think that uh, entails that you have to interact with a lot of people every day and solve their problems as well. Yeah, of course, <laughs> that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> and I think a lot of it, around 80% of that will culminate into uh, what you are going to tell us today about how to actually make a very superb presentation. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so my work revolves around major communication and presentations, of course. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Saba, if you're ready, just let me know. Uh, can you share your screen? Uh, and I will just add that into the uh, uh, into the uh, stream as well. Okay, sure. All right. My co-manager isn't available today, but she is watching the stream. <laughs> All right, so I hope so your presentations are now live. It's, it's waiting. Okay. All right, so it's still loading, I think. This is coming from a Google slide. Okay, so I all right. Start? So uh, let me just remove myself from the stream, and you can just take over. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, and over to Sabah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sabah Kasum, and today I will present on how to present. So basically, the presentation revolves on magic, magic, magic ingredients of amazing presentations, and what is the art of presenting, and how to speak publicly. Uh, a bit about me, uh, my name is Sabah Kalsum, and I call myself a digital evangelist who love memes, ideas, communities, and networking. Uh, professionally, I am a community manager here at Work Nation Space, uh, which is a co-working space located uh, at Valencia Town Lahore. So what we do is we provide space to people who are into IT, who are into uh, who are freelancing, and uh, who, who are into startups, So and they need a space, and we uh, cover their office needs. Uh, academically, I am an electrical engineer from NAST College of PME, um, graduated in 2020. And uh, But I've been working with startups from for last four years, uh, from different incubators, accelerators, and co-working spaces, and uh, got my formal entrepreneurship education from Draper University, USA. Uh, so this is how I got into communities. I have uh, been one of the Google Developer Student Club leads. I have been to events like uh, digital Youth Summit, Open Islamabad 2020, and of course, well connected across the digital ecosystem. Uh, but uh, here is the thing that it has not always been like this. Um, I too had an imposter syndrome, and uh, I even have it uh, these days sometimes. But uh, it was there was a time when uh, imposter syndrome was very much, and uh, when you start your university education and you feel like uh, you are nowhere near to the competent people around you and people are achieving so much. So uh, at that time, I started looking around and seeing that those who have achieved so much in the who are competent enough, are credible enough, wo uh, unki kya reason hai kis wajah se wo aaj ek aisi stage pe hai that people trust them people know them people like them and they kind of validate them too so what's the reason behind this and um, i found out that uh, to start me uh, everyone was is like i was a nobody right so uh, when you are a nobody even your words of wisdom sounds like bullshit like this would uh, offend some people but this is true and uh, uh, even if you are a saint, even if you have a lot of words of wisdom, but you are a nobody, people don't know you, people don't like you, they don't find you credible enough, then you are, uh, whatever you say, they won't mean it, they won't uh, matter, that won't matter. So um, I saw that, but the same people, when they become a somebody, when people know them, when people like them, and they kind of uh, trust them enough that they, yeah, they can follow them, they can, uh, they, they kind of inspire people, 
then even if they say some bullshit that sounds like words of wisdom so um, that was something shocking for me but but then i looked deeper into it and saw ki actually wo jo journey tha from a nobody to somebody wo kis tarah logo ne cover kiya and i came to know that it's all about how they communicate and how they present to the world so and and when i started being in communities when i started talking to people i saw that in professional world it is more about how you communicate and less about how smart you are like i have some friends who are genius in their industries who are uh, who are tech and techies who are genius but they don't know how to communicate and how to sell their ideas even their products or services so what but what it does to them that it hurts their businesses and it hurts their credibility and they remain a nobody even if they are a genius so i have started looking into the secret that what is that one secret that that can help me build that presentation and communication skills to be able to sell my idea to be able to sell myself to be able to sell my product or a service even and i got to know uh, this wonderful book which is made to stick it is uh, created in partnership with chip and dan hath and it 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 basically focuses on why some ideas survive and others die and it it really uh, shed light on how to build and deliver memorable presentations so that they stick to people's mind and people really want to listen and your audience do not end up like this so i have added a video here but uh, there is a bit of a glitch i guess or oh, my internet is okay so whatever my we'll skip it it was a meme though okay so we'll uh, start with the intro to presentation and uh, you should know that whenever someone starts a presentation the hook is very important because in the start when you grab the audience attention in any of the following ways then your presentation is considered to be a good presentation that is made to stick and the ways the way you can do this is in in the following you can start with an unexpected way like if you start your presentation with in a very common sense then obviously people won't be attracted but if you start it in an unexpected way in a way that if that is new to people that is unusual or surprising that will stick in people's mind or else you can you can come up with a problem and that is uh, near to people's heart like people some people are uh, really um, affected when they when they heard hear about child labor when they hear about poverty or hunger so so give them an emotional reason to care enough or you can also start with a simple unifying message like what your presentation is about and what what people can have out of it for example if i start this uh, with a with a question that how many languages do you need to know to communicate with the rest of the world now now, now what would this do is people most of the people will start thinking that how many languages are in the world and what what languages do we need to know to communicate with the world but here is a surprise that you don't need to know that number you just need one language and that language should be your own that can be english that can be urdu that can be whatever language you are good at and with a bit of help from your smartphone you can easily communicate with the rest of the world now i i i told i asked you that question because i was about to bring you a solution and that solution is google translate app now here is a tip that you don't wait till the end of presentation to give your solution you just come come up and say that for example google translate app can help you with up to 90 languages from german and japanese to zulu and it doesn't stop there next what you do is you give examples and these examples what they do is they they basically explain to the audience that what is the pain you that you cure with your solution and who is the specific person that is getting benefit from this the solution for example if i come up with an example of alberto and i say that he moved from spain to ireland and he loved soccer but feared that he had to pay to talk to coach or teammates now this is this is a story and i'm telling about a particular person who i can help with my solution now sometimes one example is not enough and we want to focus on different focus groups and we say that for example uh, marcos has opened a camera shop in paris and tourists visit him and they speak different languages so it's it, it is a bit of a problem for him to communicate with them and that's where the translation barrier comes and that 
that affects Alberto and Marcos both in a way that Alberto feels lonely and Marcos' business is getting hurt. So ideally, you speak of different people in different situations and you tell that this is how our solution helped them. Then, and then how comes the solution helped them? Then Marcos discovered Google Translate. Now he can, he can easily um, give them give their, his customers a friendly and personalized experience of what they need. And Mar uh, Alberto, of course, can get help for his soccer and coaches can help them easily. So this is how Alberto started from being an outsider, from being a nobody to being a star. And that is just because um, he, he was able to communicate through the solution that Google Translate provides. So after these examples, what you need to do is put some examples in that really relate to the audience and, or, you, or they can compare it, to, uh, it in, a, in a way that is very concrete. So sometimes stats are not uh, generally st stats are not sticky. So what you do is you relate it to people, or you compare it with something that is very familiar to people. For example, we can say that there are 23 officially recognized languages in the EU. But what, why I'm saying this? Does that make sense? No, it does not. So when I relate it to the story that I uh, earlier uh, that I uh, talked about earlier, that Marcos uses Google Translate in his shop regularly, and there are 23 officially recognized languages. That's how it, it relates to the audience. And when I say that there is um, there are more than 50 million Americans who traveled abroad in 2015, now that's a big number. So, so to, to easily comprehend it, to, to, to relate it to people, so people can compare it to something familiar, we can say that this number is more than the population of California and Texas combined. But is it really enough? Does is the is it only the thing that good presentations should have? No, good presentations end with something that can build confidence around the same idea, product, or service that we talked about earlier. So, hum isme kya cheez add kar sakte hain? We can add up milestones. We can add up testimonials that support our idea, our product, or service, and even this call to action. What's next? What's what 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 people? can have for the uh, for the upcoming that people can have so they can uh, actually use the product and get connected to you and so when you end your presentation people know that oh, you you can say that oh my god ask the bot crazy and you can add the milestones in a way that these are smart so smart is an acronym that stands for uh, that stands for specific measurable, achievable, retained, and timed. So these milestones are all time bound. These are all specific. And these are achievable for the specific solution we talked about. Because in this very presentation, I tried to sell an idea. I tried to sell a solution. So you can know that how your presentation can help sell anything, be it an idea, product, or a service. And then testimonials. Testimonials help in a way that when people see that someone else is using this product, this I, they find some people find this idea helpful. The, the person who has this idea is credible enough, can be trusted. Then other people uh, come in and they also trust that person. So then that's how testimonials come. And you, you must see testimonials on websites, on social media, where people come up and they say that they have used this product and they feel they, they are quite happy with it. And these are some of the examples of, of the exam, uh, solution that we talked about. And in the end, a call to action or, or a way to get connected is very important. So for example, in our solution, we can say that if you know a second language, just join the Google Translate community and get, get connected to us. So that's how you inspire your audience on, uh, to act on the information that they just learned in the presentation. So they know that the presentation just didn't end on a note uh, but uh, keep in your uh, minds that your appearance for the presentation really matters. So do not uh, appear, your, appear and present yourself in a way like these guys. Uh, that's it from my end. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, and you can get connected to me through uh, social media. I'm active uh, with at the name Sabakal Soon.
um, I am Sabha Kachon on Instagram and Twitter and of course on LinkedIn and Facebook. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. All right, that was a great session, Sava. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, because there's a lag in the stream, so let's wait for like around 30 to 40 seconds, see if there are any questions that are popping up. All right, uh, Saba, uh, there's a question from Vishal Malik. Share the link of the tweet or the tweeter. So uh, you can find me with the username. I am Saba Kasum, but I will share the link in the comments. Uh, you can share it in the private chat, and I can just uh, publish it in the comments. Just hold on a sec, everybody. And Saba is just typing it up, and then I will just share it with everyone. All right, I've just shared uh, Sabah's Twitter handle in the comments, excuse me. And I've just played it on the screen as well. All right, Sabah, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, that's all from our side. I don't think there are any comments. Yeah, so the next session will be with uh, Ramsha and it will start around four. So thank you very much, everybody, and see you back then.
Hi there, everyone, and we are back, and we have got Ramsha with us. Uh, all right, so we have got Ramsha with us. Uh, ah, yeah. Sorry for the we had some technical difficulties here. <laughs> all right, so we have got Ramsha here. Uh, let me add her to the stream. All right. Hello, okay. Ramsha. Hi guys, how are you? How's your Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> doing good, doing good. That's what volunteer work is all about. <laughs> all right. So Ramsha, I just read your bio a bit. Uh, I know what you do, but I want you to explain it in real terms, in layman terms as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's take the conversation out from there. All right. Um, so at my current job, I'm working on building chatbots or creating an application that helps people build their own chatbots. So um, let's say you have a business for maybe a restaurant. Um, some of your usual use cases that your customers might ask you for is like, is this item available in your menu? How do I place an order for coffee or can I cancel this order? Things like that. And you probably have some predefined scenarios of responses for um, yeah, each of these questions. So what you want to do is um, yeah, put them in, in, in a way that a machine can understand. And um, yeah, just uh, use machine learning to help understand what the user is saying, because there's different ways of saying the same thing. Once the user says something, you have a predefined response in your system or data that um, helps them get the right answer. So yeah, that's pretty much it. That's what I work in. So, <laughs> uh, just keeping it a bit more technical, um, are you working on the knowledge representation part or is it, uh, you know, tagging of words and creating a conversation out of that? Uh, it's a it's a mix of, I'd say it's a mix of both of those things. So I, I work on a flow builder. It's kind of like dialogue flow, okay. but okay. Um, yeah, it's much more refined. And then, yeah, understanding what's in the conversation is also a part of my job because, yeah, that's where machine learning goes into. All right. So Ramsha is also leading GDG Lahore. Uh, so that's a privilege to have another manager with us. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> without further ado, uh, let me share uh, your slides. Uh, from here, you can take it forward. All right. Thank you, Ramsha. All right. Thank you. OK. Um, hey, guys, anyone who's joining at this time, thank you for attending my talk on the base of a blog by Zonu Shermu. Um, she's a software engineer in um, at Walmart um, that's working in machine learning and TensorFlow. And so I hope you'll find um, this presentation very interesting. Uh, my introduction, uh, Arshan has probably um, explained most of it, but I'm a machine learning engineer who's working at a company called Boomtown. Um, it's a remote job in San Francisco, and I started this back in May. Um, before that, I worked in conversational AI and dialogue systems at I2C, which is a local company here in Lahore, um, as a data scientist for almost two years. Um, and all of the experience that I gained there is very relevant to my current job, which is making chatbots and um, yeah, working in knowledge statistics. Um, I have also been an ambassador for Women Tech Makers and for Google Developers Group Lahore for almost three years. And so far, it's going great. Um, I love talking at community events such as this one. And you know, it's, it's such a great place to meet an audience that's interested in your area of practice, like machine learning, which I hardly do in my everyday life. All right, so to start off with, um, what is query understanding and how does it relate to search? So to help explain this idea, I found this great example. Let's first understand um, the use case through a problem. Um, let's say I visit a grocery website like um, Grocer or Chite.pk, any other website like Walmart, um, and want to buy a very healthy edible. So I end up searching for a bar of chocolate with, you know, which, which should not contain uh, nuts as a nutrition. So I would search for nut-free chocolate, as mentioned in this example. But as you can see in the search results, you'd see what I'm seeing is biscuits, um, there's coffee sachets, ginger nuts, everything other than nut-free chocolate. Um, so this is a mess because the search engine is not able to understand the intent of my 
query. So in order an enhanced query to the search engine so that it gives me the appropriate results. So for current scenario, um, a solution would be that we ask the search engine to look for the term chocolate and boost the results having no nut as a filter. So therefore the result will look something like shown in the image. And now I can, you know, I'll be happy to add some of these items into my cart because they're very similar to what I searched for. So the task here comes to identify the nutrition intent, the nut free intent in the query of yeah, finding the right chocolate for me. So this sounds interesting, but along with the nutrition field, we also need to identify whether the user wants the nutrition to be present or absent in the product search for, as we have two types of nutritional filters, one which filters the product containing the nutrition. So vegetarian, vegan, you know, et cetera. And the other one that doesn't contain the nutrition. So for example, no nut, no gluten, no soya, et cetera. Um, so as of now, we considered only the nutrition attribute for better precision, but you know, you also want to maybe implement brand and other product attributes as well to fully have like a, a perfectly working search engine. So now that we know what query understanding is, let's try to understand query understanding. So from this figure, you can see that it's obvious that query understanding is about what happens before the search engine. Um, you know, it's the searcher's process of expressing an intent as a query and the search engine's process of determining that intent. So a query understanding stack starts from the bottom with the character level techniques and then moves up to token level and then entity level or query level techniques itself, which is also known as query rewriting. We're going to go through these one, of, you know, each one of these step by step. Uh, so let's start from the bottom of the stack and uh, yeah, go, go one by one. The first one is character level techniques, um, which is also known as character filtering. filtering. Um, the first step that I'm gonna take here is Unicode normalization as in normalize all of the characters by converting them into UTF-8 encodings. Second, I'd want to remove accents. So Unicode normalization transforms strings into st standard character encodings, but it does leave accents in place. For example, cafe would still have that dash over the E in, in cafe. So, and the third thing that I'd probably want to do is ignore capitalization. So we want to convert all of our strings into lowercase. The second step would be token level techniques, which includes two, ma two major things. The first one is spelling correction. And you'd probably want to use a pre-written algorithm for this case. Otherwise you'd have to have some sort of a symbol or yeah, an algorithm or mechanism to correct words given the context as well as um, yeah, the, the actual spellings of words in a dictionary, which might um, be time taking. So it's better to use like a pre-written version in, in Python maybe. Um, the second step we wanna do is stemming and lemmatization. So for stemming, we wanna use the a predefined porter stemmer and um, case stemming is also very commonly used. With lemmatization, you wanna do case stemming, which is a good option. I've used it earlier for improving search relevancy by re-ranking the results. After removing um, the inflectional suffixes, we can look into the dictionary and stop further inflectional operations. The third step is query rewriting, which is the most powerful technique that automatically transforms your search queries in order to better represent the searcher's intent so for increasing recall, the two main query rewriting strategies are query relaxation and query expansion. So here's an example from Google, and you've probably seen this while you're doing um, search on Google. Query relaxation is when we remove certain tokens from our query, and similarly, query expansion is when we add certain words to the query. So adding new words to the query is also similar to when Google auto-corrects your query to give you more sensible search results.
For increasing precision in query rewriting, the two main strategies that are used are query segmentation and query scoping. Query segmentation divides a query or yeah, a, a search um, intent into a sequence of semantic units. So for example, if you search for no milk chocolate, it can divide it into no milk chocolate or no milk and chocolate. So you have a ranking mechanism which forces it to select no milk and chocolate and not vice versa. Um, the task to identify the most relevant semantic units is therefore known as segmentation. And the um, other uh, precision improving technique is called query scoping. Um, it improves precision by matching each query segment from, uh, a, like from left to the right attribute. So it can be achieved by query tagging, which is a special case of named entity recognition that you've probably seen in um, natural language understanding or um, in other areas of NLP. So today we will implement a machine learning based state of the art deep learning model based on named entity recognition to achieve the goal of query segmentation and query scoping and improve the searcher's experience. Um, the crocodile model based on these deep learning NLP techniques can be extended for other product attributes as well. And the output JSON for it would look like something like this. So here the query is nut free chocolate and the tags are nut free and chocolate. Um, I've also mentioned a model reference here where you can follow along. It's basically the same model, but it's used for a different task of sequence tagging. We're using it for something else. Ah, now let's dive into the model architecture for the machine learning model, which I previously called the crocodile model. It consists of artificial neural networks, especially time series neural networks, like um, recurrent neural networks based on LSTMs and conditional random fields um, as a probabilistic model. Um, broadly, it can be divided into three parts. Um, the first one would be word representation. Um, first of all, we need to represent the words in the search query in the form of a feature vector for which we have um, pre-trained word embedding model that's developed using an open source implementation like Stanford's Glove or BERT. So it provides the word embedding 300 dimensional vector. And um, in our example, we're going to concatenate that with Elmo embeddings, um, as well as you know, the glove vectors. Um, the second would be contextual word representation. So for finding the contextual information between the words in a query, it is passed through a bidirectional LSTM, followed by a dense layer producing the output of the dimension, which is equal to the number of tags. So if you have six tags in your system, it should represent um, the, the final uh, representation to be 300 into six or whatever the dimension of your LSTM is. Um, finally, the third um, step is decoding. So now that we have a vector representation of each word, we apply CRF to find the best possible combination of tags. Another variant of the same model is um, character LSTM CRF. So we've created an embedding of a word at a character level using LSTMs because there may be some words like a brand which may not be present in the dictionary of pre-trained word embeddings, um, such as glove. And then you can also um, extend this to character convolutional LSTM with Elmo embeddings. It's the same model as the last one, the only difference being the neural network that generates character level embeddings, which is a convolutional neural network here in place of an LSTM before. So um, in this example that I will show later, um, I have used the character LSTM, but you can pretty much replace it with convolutional model and it should, it should work um, uh, comparably. Okay, so now let's move on to the implementation of this model in TensorFlow. Um, the API I want to start with is the tf.data API. It is a good candidate to feed the data to your model when working with high level APIs like an estimator. It introduces um, tf.data.dataset. It's a class which creates an input pipeline to read the data. It has a method called fromGenerator which generates the elements from a generator. 
and you can use the map method um, as well for feature engineering. So here you can see I have used um, DF, the data, the data set object. After getting the data set, we can do more um, like shown in um, this example. Another class which extends df.data.dataset is called dexline dataset, which takes the CSV file name as argument and it reads it for you. This API will do a lot of memory management for you when you're using its file-based datasets. You can, for example, read in dataset files much larger in memory or read in multiple files by specifying a list as an argument. So here I'm going to first shuffle the dataset that was sampled from 100 elements and then repeat the same data set for five times, which can be used for iterating through number of epochs. Um, then I will create a batch, which is batted in the default shape and buffer 2,500 records for the next iteration. Next, we're going to use TensorFlow's estimator API, which um, uses custom ed estimators and TensorFlow's um, data API for writing the code of all of the training, modeling, and evaluation. Custom estimators in TensorFlow um, comes from the class df.estimator.estimator, which wraps a model, which is specified by a model function. And df.estimator.train and evaluate utility function then trains it, evaluates it, and exports the model by using the given estimator. So let's start with this model function implementation with um, first the word representation, which was used to generate the character embedding. So here for each sentence and words, we have a list of characters. So we want to first find the index of the character that's present in the dictionary of all of our characters. So we're going to do a lookup uh, for, for every character and then initialize a variable given our dimensions, which is total number of characters or vocabulary size and dimension of the character embedding, which in this case we're taking as 100. Um, we're going to store this as an initial embedding for all of the characters before training uh, with some random floating number. Next, we're going to initialize a variable for this character embeddings and look up the embeddings for character IDs of each of our characters as present in our data. So here, the dimension of character embeddings would be the sentence, embed sentence dimension um, the word dimension, the character dimension, and then, yeah, the number of characters. Oh, sorry, sentence, word, number of characters, and then the character dimension. Um, it's kind of obvious, but I slipped up there. Ah, okay, so after that, we're going to add a dropout layer into our model, and this will help, um, yeah, improve our performance. Um, the next thing we're going to do is define the dimension of our words and um, the dimension of our characters. So the dimension of our words would be the maximum length of sentences in a batch, and the dimension of characters would be the maximum length of words in all of our sentences. Um, then we want to flatten this all out into a um, dimension of sentence times maximum number of words in a sentence, and then maximum number of characters in all of the words, and then the character dimension, which is 100. So making time major from batch major, this helps us pass it through LSTM layers much quicker. And um, if we don't reduce the dimension, then it would be uh, much difficult, much more, much more precise, but much more difficult and time consuming model for us to process. Okay, so after defining all that, we want to initialize our LSTM layers, each having 25 units. Um, this is kinds of something that you want to experiment with. Given my data, it only has 100 examples. So um, yeah, a small dimension of 100 for our character embeddings and then an LSTM block cell of 25 works fine for me, but you can experiment and yeah, use larger sizes, smaller sizes. Um, it really depends on your model's performance. So we want to define a forward block and a backward block. So we defined it both by 25. Um, then we created a backward directory um, using a time-reversed fused RNN. And a, its output dimension is maximum characters in all of the words and sentence times maximum words in a sentence. And then the character embedding size, which is now 25 after passing through the LSTM layer. 
<coughs> so here the timestamps, which is the length of the sequence, as in a sentence, is equal to the number of characters in each of the words. So here, once we pass it through the LSTM cell forward function, we get the output for the forward function. Similarly, we would get the output for our backward function or reversed by LSTM. Um, then we want to concatenate the outputs of both the forward and backward function across a single axis to get a final output layer that's dimension is maximum characters in all of the words, um, sentence times maximum words in a sentence, and the character embedding size, which is now 25 in plus 25, as in forward function output plus backward function output. So that's equal to 50. We want to reshape this to number of sentences, maximum number of words, and 50. So we've done that to create character embeddings. Now that we've created our character embeddings, the next step in our pipeline, if you remember from before, was to generate word embeddings. So for each sentence, we now have a list of words. We want to find the index of words present in the dictionary of all of our words. So we're going to do a lookup for each word in our vocabulary of words. And um, our vocabulary of words in this example is glove embeddings. So we're getting the glove embeddings for all of our words. And we're appending an extra embedding to our data set if some word is not found. It's commonly done using the UNK token, but here I've just added it as a, yeah, as a separate word. Oh, one thing I want to mention here is that if you use a pre-trained embedding layer or pretty much any pre-trained layer, you want to keep trainable false. And um, yeah, that's important so that your model isn't um, fine tuning a layer that is not supposed to um, change. <coughs> okay. So now we want to look up the word embeddings in the dictionary that we created as non-trainable. Once we do that, we get our word embeddings. And then what we want to do is concatenate our character and word embeddings to get the maximum juice we want out of um, our data um, in terms of what the model can understand from both character level features and word level features. So here we've done that. Um, the final um, representation or the final dimension of this um, vector would now be uh, the dimension of the sentences, the words, and 50 plus 300, where 300 is the size of the glove embedding vector. You can use a smaller one or a larger one or use some other pre-trained layers up to you. But the final one in this example is going to be 350. <coughs> OK. So now we want to move on to contextual word representation. We have our pre-trained um, representations for words and our um, LSTM produced representations of characters combined together to have this um, initial um, vectors of both character and word level features. Next, we want to dive into contextual word representations, which is something that the model learns from the combination of these two features. So our time uh, dimension looks like, our input shape looks like sentences, words, and then 350. We're going to take a transpose of this across the time dimension and pass it through LSTM um, layers that are now of cells 100. Um, again, this, um, this dimension of 100 is something that you can tune according to your own model's performance or the size of your data set. Mine was pretty small, so this works. So I, I declare a forward layer and a backward layer. And then I pass this backward layer into a time reverse function to make it a reverse LSTM. Um, the next time steps are sequence length, where sequence length represent the number of words in each sentence. From this um, uh, LSTM functions, we will get the output for the forward layer, as well as the output for the backward layer, passing in the character plus word embeddings concatenated inputs. Once we get those, um, this final output of um, forward and backward layer for an LSTM are then concatenated to generate one final output. And um, you can guess the dimension for this. If the output from the forward LSTM was 100 and the backward was also 100, then in this case, the dimension of this new output layer would be 200. We're going to take a transpose of this across the time dimension to um, yeah, conform it to this new dimension or new shape. 
After this, we want to pass it through our um, output layer or a dense layer, which is equal to the number of tags in our domain. In our domain, it's a pretty small example. So the number of tags were six. We're going to pass this output layer into this dense layer, which will then convert it or reduce it down to this dimension from 200 to only six. Now we want to decode um, this representation of um, sentence, words, and six using um, CRFs. So first we want to create a variable and initialize as a transition score from one tags to another tags in determining the score of particular combination of tags. So we define the CRF params um, using TensorFlow. We are using the number of tags that were defined earlier in this example. Once we determine the tags for each sentence, which is sentenced into number of tags, we want to pass it through TensorFlow's crf.crf decode function, which takes as input the number of logits, um, the CRF parameters, and the length of tags to produce prediction IDs for decoding. Now we want to calculate the loss and optimize it using log likelihood as our loss function. So we're going to use TensorFlow's crf.crf log likelihood. We're going to pass in our logits, our correct tags, um, the length of our tags and CRF params produced earlier. And we're going to take um, the reduced mean of this negative log likelihood. Then we're going to optimize our performance or use an atom optimizer to minimize the loss. Um, and we're going to use df.train.atomoptimizer.minimize for this function. This is pretty standard for most ML models. So I would hope that if you're familiar with TensorFlow, you would be familiar with at least this portion of the code. <coughs> the um, previously explained estimator model can now be saved in a directory which exports inference graph as a saved model into the given called TensorFlow Serving. So here you can see estimator.export saved model as um, content model, um, yeah, where, wherever the uh, model is lying that's passed in as the um, location of the model and the serving input receiver function that's also passed in. Um, you can run it on Docker if you prefer. Um, that's what most people use. And um, the parameters or configurations you want to use for this are minus T, TensorFlow slash serving, where you want to pass in the model config file, which includes the JSON input representation for your model. So the TensorFlow serving model response for nut-free chocolate should look something like this, where each element inside the array represents the output for each of the words. So um, that's pretty much it in terms of search query understanding. Um, this was a pretty simple example, and it explained um, four, four methodologies um, in our uh, yeah in, in in the search area, mainly search expansion, search relaxing, search segmentation, or query segmentation, and um, query scoping. Um, and then we implemented a model using named entity recognition and CRF uh, to understand what each of the tokens inside uh, a query represent and get the final outputs, which should hopefully help a search engine optimize results um, in terms of yeah what, what a user might be looking for. There's a lot more to explore in this. Um, if you use Google search, you know that it has a lot of these cool features where you can minimize uh, your scope or maximize your scope of the search based on certain words. It also gives you um, the um, ability to select different domains in which you can search. Um, and then even if you search something, it gives you certain options of like, which area do you want to look at in? And it also ranks those areas based on relevance to the query. There are a ton of more things that you can look into um, in Google search or um, in search in general, which are not the scope of this conversation, but hopefully this has given you some uh, motivation to look more into search, um, especially if you're a machine learning developer. All right, um, thank you. That's been uh, pretty much it from my side. If you have any questions, you can either leave them in the live chat and I can get back to you or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Thanks.
All right, that was a really interesting session. I was all the way with you till you start yeah. uh, delving into the code in the matrices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I understood the normalization part and the tokenization part. That was great. Um, uh, I haven't myself delved ever into the uh, either the knowledge representation or the uh, conversational AI. But uh, I have talked with a lot of mentors uh, who uh -huh. actually have uh, developed soft robots uh, that are implementing these kind of strategies, especially uh, one of the people he has implemented conversational AI uh, for Urdu uh -huh. in order to understand the whole language and then uh, to actually make a knowledge graph out of it and then yeah. move forward. Oh, that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I do know that people in Pakistan are progressing in this field. Um, recently, someone opened up a Raza community in Lahore. Raza is like the major open source platform for conversational AI. And so it, it's a very, I would say it's a very niche group of people who are like super into conversational AI. I, I had no expectations that there would be like a small community here especially in Lahore, but um, yeah, I was surprised to know that. So yeah, definitely a lot of people yeah. are working in this. Yeah, it's, it's improving. I'm really proud of that. <laughs> it actually oh, wow. takes a lot of time to actually go all the way to there, uh, yeah. all the way to that point that you are able to, you know, understand and then another few <laughs> efforts uh, to actually start implementing these things. And uh, lo and behold, if somebody wants to do it on a totally different <laughs> language where there is no support or anything available that's a really yeah. uh, you know uh, worthwhile effort that they can do yeah. and if they are doing it uh, sort of in a way that uh, the uh, different scriptural uh, languages can be used for example uh, for the, one of the things that uh, the european nations and the western nations have is that they all their scripts are based in latin but whereas if you move towards the east there are uh, as many scripts as their languages so uh, yeah. <laughs> their recognition, their grammatical structures, they are totally, totally different. And they are yeah. somewhat relatable, but not uh, very independent. So that's mm -hmm. a really good effort from each and every uh, uh, part of the community that mm -hmm. they are trying to make sure that uh, digitization is happening. I think mm -hmm. uh, I saw a video somewhere on Facebook as well. Somebody made a programming language in Urdu as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you can start <laughs> programming in Urdu. <laughs> and that's that's actually good. I wish there were like keyboards in Urdu where, yeah, if that would maybe make it easier. If someone is working on hardware for Urdu, then um, yeah, you could use programming. You could type in Urdu. It would be a lot easier for us. There, there are keyboard layouts available in Urdu, but again, in Urdu, the problem is that uh, the computer should understand that which of the two characters yeah. that you need to merge uh, with mm -hmm. respect to the script, uh, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, Auto completion, like yeah. Urdu if if yeah. there is a noon in the end, that means it's going to be the round one, and if it is ah, yeah. noon and alif, that means the small one will be used and the alif will be attached with it. So it, yeah. it becomes a little bit difficult just to code it in if then else. You have to code it yeah. in a very different uh, AI based structure so that uh, the computer yeah. can understand that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I do work in natural language, so I, I do understand the, the complexities of different languages. And um, yeah, ours ours is definitely right up there with RB and uh, all the yeah. different difficult languages. Um, yeah, I pray someone builds this. Cause, um, yeah, honestly, I'm not, but um, it's, it's definitely needed. Like, there's a lot more people who do programming now and want to do it in Urdu. So. Yeah, this should definitely be coming up um, in, in the coming years. And again, one of the aspects, uh, uh, if we are going towards that side, uh, that would be from a very uh, culture preservation kind of a thing that more and more digitization is occurring. Uh, the languages that are not available in the digital platform, they are getting uh, uh, niche and niche. And then there would be only, you know, uh, the remote languages that are only speak, uh, spoken just only with a few because they are not available on the digital platforms, especially the digital platforms that are widely used. Mm, that's true, yeah, that's very true. All right, thank you very much, Ramsha, for your time. Right, thank and, you. uh, this, you know, very in-depth kind of a session on how to actually, how actually the queries are working. This is the first time I've actually linked the uh, conversational AI with uh, how the Google is working in the background. Uh, 
Yeah, um, yeah. For, even for me, for learning this, um, this straight come out of uni. So they, they don't really teach these things yeah. in university. I don't know how it's like in, in Islamabad, but in Lahore, it's nothing. Like you only get to study machine learning in your final year, and only even even then, only if you do your own research. And yeah, you prior do your research um, during a summer vacation, and then select a good project. Would you get into a domain, and then you'd have to yeah look up a bunch of online courses, read a lot of research papers, <laughs> and yeah, then yeah, you figure out like, hey, this is how it's implemented. Otherwise, it's just a knowledge that people have within themselves and they really need to come out to these community events and share it with people so that other people also know, maybe publish books, and yeah, it becomes a regular thing. That's, that's my two cents to everybody, or especially the juniors who are uh, currently in the undergrad or even, even in the postgrad uh, world. Mm -hmm. uh, Masters, those people. Mm -hmm. uh, my recommendation is always: yeah, go out and look for yourself. The academia is not going to do much, and yeah, my word to the academia is: please do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> Sad. All right. So thank you again, Ramcha, for this great uh, session. Uh, and uh, if there is any question, that would be available in the live chat, as well as you have already posted, shared your uh, LinkedIn. So okay. anybody who is interested can contact you there. All right, thank All right. you very much. Bye. All right, so that brings us to the close of today's uh, live session with uh, about machine learning. And uh, actually it brings us close to the session of Google Extended, uh, IO Extended. So, uh, I would like to thank all of you who attended the sessions and hopefully that will contribute to your professional learning as well. So thank you very much and 